All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Richard Dick Thomas Memorial Student Competition, or as we call it, the DTA. Um, this event is organized and put on annually by the Washington GIS Association, or WGISA. We wanna thank all of the students and their advisors and judges and all of the volunteers who make this virtual competition possible. Uh, we appreciate the flexibility and patience that we've received from the students and judges as well. We pretty regularly have to wait for and accommodate to the conference. And so that's why sometimes dates and information can take a while to get out there. Um, but all the students and judges have been really responsive and we thank you for providing all your guys' pronunciations on short notice. I still might find a way to mess them up, but I will try my best. Uh, we hope this year's competition will provide you with valuable experience for your future work. That is the main intent of this competition. Um, before we get started, I'm going to share a little bit on the competition etiquette. Um, students, please keep your cameras and microphones off until it's your time to present. Right now is fine, but once we begin the, the competition, just uh, let's not interrupt any of the, the speakers. And then judges, coordinators, conference volunteers, anyone who's not a student, please keep your cameras on and the microphones off until it's time to ask questions. This is to provide the students with an audience that they can present to. And everyone, please make sure your phones are silent. I need to do the same myself. Um, that is usually a, can be a buzzkill for whoever's presenting. Um, and to any extra guests, please keep your microphones and cameras off during the presentations. We're not gonna allow any heckling this year, so. Uh, now for a little bit of the historical background of the competition. The Richard Dick, Thomas, uh, Richard Dick Thomas Competition and Award was established to honor a Washington State GIS pioneer and mentor named Dick Thomas, who passed away in 2006. The intent of this award is to honor Dick by continuing his work of encouraging students to present their original research in GIS, geography, and related disciplines at the annual WGISA conference, and to help students transition successfully into GIS careers. We express a big thank you to Dick Thomas and the legacy he has left for the GIS community here in Washington. So next, I'm going to introduce our judges and coordinators. So everyone, when I introduce you, could you just say hello really briefly? You don't have to introduce yourself. I'm going to do that. But if you say hello, your name should pop up on screen so people can see who you are. Uh, first, we are going to start with my colleague and coworker, Aaron Angus. Hey, everybody. Aaron has worked for the city of Seattle for 11 years, and he's currently the utility GIS lead at Seattle Public Utilities. Thanks for being here, Aaron. Next, we have uh, Stella Spring, who is a GIS software engineer. Stella, are you here? Yes. Hello. Great to see you. Um, she is a GIS software engineer supporting 911 data for Skagit County. She has a background in fishery science and stormwater. And additionally, she belongs to a Toastmasters group that helps anyone with public speaking and interview skills. And Stella's graciously offered her contact information to anyone who is interested in joining. And this is a great example of one of the benefits of belonging to an organization like WGISA, where GIS professionals are constantly helping each other out and creating opportunities for other people. So I appreciate that, Stella. Next, we have Bill Keller. Hey, good morning. Hey, Bill. Uh, Bill Keller is the GIS coordinator at the city of Puyallup, and he also serves as a GIS lead for an emergency management coalition of seven cities and towns in East Pierce County. Might have something to do with that big mountain that's sitting over all of them. <laughs> Prior to working with uh, Puyallup, he was a geologist with the Washington Geological Survey and the National Park Service at Yellowstone, which is really neat. I'm super jealous. And then last, our last judge is Joanne Marker. Hi, everybody. Hey, Joanne. 
Joanne is the state GIS coordinator and has been with WATEC, the Washington IT department for the past five years. She also worked in private and public sector roles for 25 years and is loving it. Um, she's also wanted to mention that she's excited to see the next generation of GIS professionals. So uh, students, you have a great audience and judge cohort. And so this is a great opportunity for all of you. Last, we have our two Dick Thomas Award coordinators, Dan Miller. Morning, everybody. Dan has been the E, uh, Dan is the E99, E911 GIS coordinator for the state of Washington 911 office. Sorry for butchering the title. <laughs> and uh, butcher up something. Yeah, I didn't, I managed to mess up something. <laughs> And he's also the chair of the Community Engagement Committee for Wojissa. And then last, we have me, uh, Taylor Dixon. Uh, I'm a senior GIS analyst for Seattle Public Utilities. I'm also an at-large board member for Wojissa, and I'm the current Technology Committee co-chair. And the other co-chair is also here. Uh, many of you know him, Gregory Lund. All right. For a quick reminder on the rules, each group is going to have up to 15 minutes to present with up to three additional minutes for questions. And to be clear, we will be holding this to a strict cutoff. And that's part of the objective competition element of this, of the DTA, is that you won't even get a second over 15 minutes. So we will be sending you guys uh, updates. Um, Dan's going to put in the chat what minute marker it's at. So we'll give you like a five, it's been five minutes, it's been 10 minutes, maybe even a 13, 14, 15. So uh, just be aware that whatever content you wanna fit into there, get it done before 15 minutes. And after that, like we said, we'll have three minutes for questioning. And then after that, we will give the judges two minutes to fill out their scoring sheets. Judges, please let me know if you are having trouble getting into the, uh, the scoring sheet. And uh, during that time, the next uh, group should be getting ready to present. Dan, if you could go to the next slide so they can see the order of presentations. So please, see keep... yeah, we can see. Okay. It. Yeah. So please keep your eye on the chat to make sure you're you're seeing the queue times. And then before we start our first presentation, I'm going to give you guys a tiny bit of warm advice. Uh, to the students. As you present, just remember to breathe and keep in mind that uh, many of the volunteers and judges today have been in your shoes in years past. And even though sometimes it might seem like we are cold, objective judges, we are actually all wishing you an enthusiastic good luck at your project. We all want to see you succeed. So um, the competition is still a competition and that's not going to change. But at the end of the day, everyone's super excited to see what you have to present and we all want you to do well so now it is time for the presentations so the order was determined uh by the order that the abstracts were submitted so our first presentation will now be given by avery wolf gray mckenna and victoria fox from the university of washington um their project is titled Bull Kelp Restoration Site Selection in the Puget Sound. So with that, I turn the floor over to you three and go ahead and share your screen and it should kick Dan's screen share off. And as soon as you guys start, we will hit the timer. Can you see my screen? Yep. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much, Taylor, and, and thank you to all the judges and organizers of this competition. We're very excited to be here. My name is Gray McKenna. My co-presenters today are Avery Wolf and Victoria Fox, and our fourth team member who's not presenting with us today is Charlotte Ainsworth. And we get to tell you about our bulk help restoration site selection tool that we built for Puget Sound as part of our University of Washington GIS certificate program and in partnership with Puget Sound Restoration Fund. 
But before we get into the GIS, it's important to know that kelp forests are a critical nearshore ecosystem in the Salish Sea. So they provide habitat structure, they cycle nutrients, including carbon, and they play important cultural roles for tribes, coastal communities all around the Salish Sea. And bull kelp, the only canopy forming species in the Puget Sound, is what you see here in this photo. So this is our forest forming species. And unfortunately, kelp forests are on the decline in Puget Sound. So the Washington State Department of Natural Resources has documented a 67% loss in bull kelp in the south basin of Puget Sound. And in the central basin of Puget Sound, we've observed total loss of bull kelp beds around Bainbridge Island. In response to these declines, local nonprofit Puget Sound Restoration Fund has begun developing techniques to restore kelp and outplant it and try to regrow it at sites where it has been lost. And these techniques are in development at a small scale right now at just one site in Central Sound. And one of the barriers to expanding kelp restoration is that there's no tool to aid restoration practitioners in selecting additional sites that might have good potential for kelp restoration. And so that's where our project comes in. Our goal is to synthesize available data into a user-friendly web mapping application in order to assist restoration practitioners like Puget Sound Restoration Fund in selecting sites with potential for future kelp forest restoration projects in Puget Sound. And the product that we are creating is an interactive ArcGIS online web mapping application with two primary components to address both the environmental aspects of project planning and the regulatory aspects. So not just does this environment support kelp growth, but can I get a permit to do this work here? And so the two components of our project are a kelp habitat suitability model and then regulatory reference layers. And I'm going to pass it to Victoria now to tell us about the habitat suitability model. Yeah, thanks, Gray. So as you just saw, the first element of the project is a habitat suitability model. And we wanted this model to be able to answer the question, where in Puget Sound do environmental and biological conditions potentially support bull kelp growth, reproduction, and persistence? The first phase of developing the model was mostly background research. We reviewed all of the scientific literature that we could get our hands on to determine what parameters are most important for bull kelp survival. And at the same time, we searched for publicly available data sets on those parameters in Puget Sound. Uh, from that research, we were able to compile a list of the data layers to be included in the model, and we selected sources that could be used to create each layer. The source we chose for temperature, salinity, and current speed was the Salish Sea model, which is a coastal model developed by the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And we use their 2014 hydrodynamic model outputs. For uh, nutrient concentrations and light transmission, we used marine monitoring data from the Department of Ecology. And we obtained data about kelp distribution and substrate type from the Department of Natural Resources Nearshore Habitat Program. And finally, we acquired a set of high resolution depth rasters from NOAA. So after acquiring all of these data sources, we transformed them into raster layers that could be used in the habitat suitability model. And I'm going to walk through a few of the processing workflows that we used. Uh, most of the data that we acquired was in tabular form, such as CSV or NetCDF, and we wrote scripts in R and Python to calculate statistics from these files. For example, for the temperature layer, we calculated the average daily maximum surface temperature at each model location. We used XY table to point to map these locations as point features, and we were then able to join our calculated statistics to the point features and finally, use spline width barrier to interpolate rasters from the point data. Uh, the other type of input data that we in encountered was line features, such as these shoreline substrate types. We wanted the substrate attributes to extend offshore into the growing area. And the first step to accomplish this was to generate points at the endpoints of each line feature, create very small buffers around each point, and then use the buffers to erase the ends of each line. So now none of the line features are quite intersecting each other. We then generated points along each line at very close intervals and created Thiessen polygons. That means there's a polygon corresponding to each point feature 
and the entire area contained within each polygon is closer to its associated point than to any other point in the feature class. So in effect, the entire area is divided up according to which line feature it's closest to. We turn the Thesen polygons into a raster, and then we use the extract by mask tool to remove the parts of the raster that are on land. So now I think I'm gonna hand the presentation back to Gray to talk about the rest of the habitat suitability model process. Yeah, so after we had converted all of our input variables to rasters using the processes that Victoria just described, the next step is to reclassify them all onto a common scale. For this project, we use from one to nine. So values that are more suitable will get a higher score closer to nine, symbolized in green here, and values that are less suitable will get a value closer to one. After everything has been reclassified to a common scale, we can assign them relative weights. And then each cell in the input layers will get multiplied by that weight and combined in a weighted overlay model. So here's what that weighted overlay output might look like. Here in green, you can see areas that might be more suitable for kelp based on our inputs symbolized in green. And with lower scores in red, um, yeah, with lower scores that might be less suitable for bulk kelp sim symbolized in red. And now the last step was to take a one third arc second DEM that we acquired from NOAA and convert it to a title datum and then extract just the zero to the minus 10 meter mean lower low depth distribution because that's the common distribution for kelp in Puget Sound and use that as a mask to extract our final model output. Now to try and calibrate the model, we compared our model output to the best and most comprehensive bulk kelp distribution data set available, which is from the Department of Natural Resources nearshore shore zone inventory. So here's a subset of our model zoomed into the Tacoma Narrows. And we extracted all of the cells from our output that were within the known bulk kelp distribution, the data sets from around the year 2000, it's symbolized in blue here. And then we can calculate summary statistics for all of those extracted cells and get a mean cell value. Then we could go back to our model and adjust classification schemes and relative input weights to try and maximize this score. The assumption here being that if our model agrees more closely with the known bulk kelp distribution in 2000, it's performing better and more accurately. We constructed all of this in ArcGIS Pro Model Builder. Here's a quick screen grab of what that looked like. And this was really helpful in being able to go back and systematically adjust the classification schemes and weights and run this process over and over. Now, there are a couple limitations to the model. First is that knowledge of bull kelp biology and ecology in Puget Sound is still pretty limited. And so many of our model decisions were made without really sufficient information. And the other major limitation is, of course, our model inputs are limited to data available, although there may be many other variables not captured here that are playing a large role in suitability um, of kelp habitat. And because of these two limitations, we place a very heavy emphasis on documentation throughout our process so that as new data sets and knowledge emerge about this habitat, the model can be expanded upon and, and rerun and built upon. So now I'll pass it to Avery to talk a little bit about the regulatory reference layers. Great, thank you. So like we mentioned earlier, along with the habitat suitability model that Gray and Victoria discussed, there is a second component to our map, which is the regulatory reference layers. Um, this information pertains to who has rights to certain waters, what activities take place there, what other species need to be considered, and much more. In the state of Washington, anyone wishing to carry out such a restoration project, as we've been discussing, must submit a Joint Aquatic Resources Permit Application, or JARPA, as you can see here. Um, we based a lot of our desired regulatory data on information asked for in the JARPA, with some guidance from our project sponsor on what information would be most helpful. Much like with the habitat suitability model, our next step was to search for this data. Some of our criteria included that the data must be publicly available for no cost, and that it must be relatively up to date. We scoured many sources to find data layers both already hosted through ArcGIS online and available for download. We ended up with a total of eight regulatory data layers from these four sources. From the Department of Ecology, we were able to find information on hydrologic cataloging units, water resource inventory areas, shoreline management act jurisdictions, and water quality assessment sediment listings. 
From the Department of Natural Resources, we found information on existing aquatic reserves. And from the Washington Department of Transportation, we gathered information on ferry routes and location. Lastly, from NOAA, we were able to obtain information on Endangered Species Act critical habitat areas. After vetting these layers, we downloaded them all before some minim minimal processing in ArcGIS Pro. While we wanted our end user to be able to look layer by layer in our map, we also wanted them to be able to click anywhere on the Puget Sound in the map and pull up a single pop-up with all of the information or most important information from all of our layers combined. We created a layer union as seen here to do this, and here is a preliminary version of what this pop-up would look like. And that brings us to our final project deliverables. The most important being, of course, our interactive web application. And here we have a quick demo of how this works. When the web tool loads for the first time, it displays a splash screen introducing the user to the suitability model. We can click out of that splash screen and then zoom into our area of interest. Let's say we're interested in doing a restoration project around the south end of Whidbey Island. It looks like this area and this area both have pretty good suitability rankings. We can also look through the model input layers individually. Here's current speed and here's temperature. The second component of the web tool is the regulatory map. It also opens with an informational splash screen. If we zoom in again on our area of interest, we can click anywhere on the screen and see information about that area. As with the other map, we can also view some of these regulatory layers individually. Here are the nearby, nearby ferry routes. And here are the boundaries of the water resource inventory areas. The web tool also has an about page, which gives more information about the project and our methodology for creating each layer. Thank you for that demo, Victoria. On the next couple of slides, I just have some high level overview screen grabs of our two maps, more of an insurance policy in case our demo video wouldn't play. So I'm gonna go through those quickly. Here's the regulatory, perfect. Um, along with our application itself, we have also created pro project documentation as Gray touched on earlier to aid in the handoff to our project sponsor. Um, the first is this two page summary. It gives a, the reader a quick overview of our project, sharing our purpose and what to expect from the end product. We are also writing a report to document our project process from data processing to um, sources. At the end of our school program, our project sponsor will be responsible for maintaining our web map. So we want to give them as much necessary information to do so. And while our scope is limited to the time constraints of our project, it is our hope that Puget Sound Restoration Fund continues to improve our GIS tool over time, as Gray also mentioned. Um, some of the potential next steps that they could take are to extend the tool to cover all of Washington waters and not just the Puget Sound, and also to improve the classification and weighting as new knowledge on bulk health emerges. Here are our data sources for our environmental layers, and next for our regulatory layers. With that, we'd like to thank everyone who helped us along our way in creating this project. And if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask us outside of today's competition, feel free to reach out to any of us. These are our emails. With that, thank you all for your time and consideration, and we are happy to answer any questions. All right, we have three minutes for questions. Judges and anyone watching can ask questions. Uh, I do have a question, a few questions. First of all, great job, guys. Um, fantastic. <laughs> Um, you did a lot of um, really slick stuff and made it look easy. And a lot of what you guys did was not easy behind the scenes to do that. Um, so I'm just going to list you off these three questions real quick. You guys can answer them as you have time. Um, so your regulatory reference layers, um, did you download those and you're hosting them kind of on ArcGIS Online or are you referencing them and streaming them in from those outside sources? Um, the Good job on the experience builder. I'm just curious how your experience was with experience builder. I've been doing a lot with it myself and I've found it an experience to use. Um, so good job on that. It's looking nice. Um, and I'm, I'm curious um, how you are 
um, hoping that any kind of future people continuing on with this are going to work in Experience Builder being a kind of a complex program, how they're going to be able to ex uh, expand on what you guys have done and modify it um, because it's not super intuitive. Um, and then lastly, who's hosting this? Um, you know, is this on UW's ArcGIS Online? Are you transferring this to a, a third party? Um, kind of how's that going? I'll touch on the regulatory reference layer question first. We did first download all the layers and then process them into that union in ArcGIS Pro and then host that layer. There's also a couple of other layers that weren't available already hosted that we downloaded and hosted, but everything else that was already hosted by a different organization, we're just pulling from AJOL into our map, so not hosting it just because uh, one of your other questions, who, um, where is our web application? It's already on our project sponsors, ArcGIS online account, and we don't want to burn up too many of their credits. Uh, I might let Gray answer some of the other questions about Experience Builder. Yeah, I'll, I will say that our lead cartographer was Charlotte, our group member who is not presenting with us today. But um, yeah, we've definitely found Experience Builder to be also <laughs> an experience. I think there are some elements that are really intuitive, but it can be a little bit challenging to like get outside of the, the tool defaults. And then um, in terms of how we hope Puget Sound Restoration Fund will keep building on this, I actually work for Puget Sound Restoration Fund, so I'm their in-house in GIS person. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll have all of this information and materials and be able to continue to work with the other researchers and folks at PSRF um, to build the tool. Great, thank you. I have a question. Um, I'm always really interested in data sharing and uh, you touched on it a little bit and that it's with the restoration fund, but is there an opportunity to share this back with some of the public agencies or is there any interest there? Or how could this be more widely distributed? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. We are really excited to share this tool, particularly with the Department of Natural Resources. There was a, a recent bill that got passed in the Washington State Legislature that's providing some funding for DNR to actually develop a tool to help select sites for conservation and restoration. And um, Puget Sound Restoration Fund already partners pretty closely with the Department of Natural Resources and with some other agencies involved in the management of the kelp resource. So we're we participate in the, all their like monthly kelp meetings, et cetera. So we're looking forward to sharing the tool with them. And then we, we have like regular email contact with their Nearshore team as well. So hopefully there'll be lots of opportunity for sharing the tool. Yeah, that'd be great. Cause I help manage the geo.wa.gov website. And so I'd love to see this shared through DNR and back up to that spot. Very Let cool. me know if okay. uh, I can help facilitate that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Joanne. All right, that's all the time we have for the questions. So thank you, Avery and Gray and Victoria. Um, we're going to give the judges two. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for that. Well, you can't. Question. I mean, it's kind of unsatisfying in the yeah. virtuals. Yeah. Um, so we're going to give the judges two minutes to fill out their scoring sheets or, or finish filling them out. And in the meantime, we are going to have um, Samuel, Eliza, and Molly get ready. So two minutes.
All right, we are ready for our next presentation. So next we have Samuel Hayro, Eliza Cronenberg, Cronenberger, sorry, and Molly McGuire from the University of Washington GIS CERT program. They are presenting on the topic, Patterns of Seasonal Movement and Spatial Distribution of Elk in the Blue Mountains. And whenever you guys are ready, we will start your time. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Today, we are presenting work from our ongoing uh, Blue Mountain Elk Collaring Project as part of the University of Washington GIS Certificate Program. Uh, this project is sponsored by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and we are excited to be here with you all today. So uh, we wanted to start off by briefly introducing ourselves. My name is Eliza Cronenberger. My name is Samuel Hayro. And I'm Molly McGuire. So here's the outline for the presentation today. We will discuss a brief project overview, objectives, research and methods, map analysis and results, our challenges faced, and next steps for the project in the next couple weeks as our program comes to an end. To give a brief overview of our project, our study area is the Northern Blue Mountains in Oregon, which are home to over 4,000 elk. Locals in the area reported damage caused by elk to property and crops, which created a conflict between the elk and landowners. And in response, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife deployed 147 GPS collars on elk in this region, taking the location of each individual every 13 hours for two years to study space use patterns like migration, home range, and relationships with public and private lands. The research questions that we aim to answer through this project are, where is the home range of the Blue Mountain Elk and where do they migrate seasonally? What are the monthly distribution patterns on public and private land as well as other wildlife areas? And do elk movement patterns change during hunting seasons and how do human disturbances affect the elk behavior? In finishing up this project, we aim to create a geodatabase to include migration corridors, home ranges and distribution of population, compile Blue Mountain Elk location and terrain data, package all data preparation and workflow analyses into Model Builder for our project sponsor to perform these analyses on any individual in the data set or the herd as a whole, and to create summaries, maps, and graphs to visualize elk space use patterns. All of our data for this project comes from the Oregon Department of Forestry, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, USGS, the Oregon Spatial Data Library, and the University of Washington. And with that, I will pass it off to Sam for migration and home range analysis. All right, really quick, just to summarize our overall uh, analyses and the results. Um, in order to reach our project objectives, we've pursued two primary avenues of analysis, and we'll be working to see if we conduct uh, a third before our project deadline. Our seasonal analyses have looked at elk migration routes and the timing of their movements, as well as the characteristics of their home ranges between migrations. Meanwhile, our distribution analysis has examined the patterns in elk distribution on the landscape, particularly the occupancy of public versus private lands and potential shifts in these patterns related to hunting pressure. With those two avenues moving from their beginning phases to refinement and finalization, some of our team will be moving to develop workflows for investigating elk responses to roads. However, we don't have results to present on that today. Now, before we could begin our work, we had to prepare data. First, we removed any collared individuals outside of our study group and eliminated any post-mortality points using the mortality data provided to us by ODFW. Before our next data preparation steps, we had to determine and tabulate migration events and their corresponding start and end dates. From those migration dates, we created and populated several fields denoting migration or home range status and season groups for each data point. Because of the size of our data set, we have 147 individual elk and more than 20,000 data points over the two year period. All of our data prep and analysis models made heavy use of the iterative tools native to ArcPro's model builder. Um, when we began piloting our migration analysis workflow, we hoped to find a way to automate the identification of migration events and took a look at the use of ArcPro's density based clustering tool. While this tool had promise, we ultimately decided that it was not adept enough at properly identifying groupings of points in migration or occupying seasonal home ranges. 
In order to precisely delineate migration dates, we manually, manually reviewed the data for each colored individual, noted the start and end dates of migration events, and created a table denoting sequential migration events for each individual. With this data tabulated, we were able to calculate home range residence dates between migration events for kernel density estimate analysis and create our migration track line and buffers for mapping. Although they take longer to produce and take up more space than simple polylines, we found track lines preferable for continued analysis and enhanced symbolization as they retain the time data associated with reports. So, in addition to preparing track lines for the creation of maps and analyzing migration in the Blue Mountain Elk Herd. Specifically, ODFW relayed their interest in the average beginning and end dates of the spring and fall migrations, which you see here, and the variations in migratory strategy within the herd. While we have these summary statistics for the herd as a whole, the variation in migra migratory patterns between in individuals varies fairly widely. Um, approximately 92% of the elk exhibited some degree of migratory movement over the two-year study period, but the specifics of these movements vary significantly. Most migration events occurred in spring and fall, but we see a large minority of events occurring in winter and some even happening in summer. Some migratory individuals deviate from the expected biannual spring and fall migrations, moving three or four times in a single year. Many individuals showed mixed migration patterns, moving in one of the years, but not the other with an average of roughly 2.5 migration events per elk over the two-year study period. Interestingly, a small number of elk exhibited what we termed post-capture migration or movement, where the animal moved a significant distance immediately after their capture for collaring. Our summary of the strengths and statistics for the herd are ongoing, but overall we can say that migratory strategies vary widely throughout the Blue Mountain herd. As for home range analysis, while the GIS workflow for our migration analysis and mapping is largely complete, the process for creating and analyzing seasonal home ranges is still a work in progress. Using the same table of migration dates from the previous analysis, we associated each group of points between migration events with unique home range IDs and made a model to create rough KDE rasters. Unfortunately, the KDE tool in our pro does not allow for the creation of statistically rigorous 95% home range estimates and integration with R is necessary for us to move forwards. Uh, because none of us are very experienced in R, we are still working on integrating the use of that program to create 95% KDEs in a way that will be automatable, using R Pro's native tool as a placeholder in our model while we build out our statistical analysis workflow to be used on our final accurate rasters. And with that, I'll hand it off to Eliza to speak about our distribution analysis. Great. Um, so next, we're going to talk about the analysis of elk distribution part of our project. Our project sponsor was interested in assessing habitat utilization of these elk by documenting their spatial distributions on public and private lands throughout each month that they were collared over the two-year period. So to begin that analysis uh, process, I collected a land management data layer from the state of, um, of the state of Oregon, courtesy of the Oregon Department of Forestry. As you can see, this layer was separated into eight major uh, land classes. So I reclassified the federal and state lands uh, to constitute the new uh, public lands layer and kept the existing private lands uh, and excluded irrelevant uh, classes such as water and industrial layers. Um, then I imported elk data consisting of nearly 300,000 data points uh, after mortalities were removed, um, shown on the right and um, did a spatial join to link that layer with the land class and uh, clipped it, uh, which left me with approximately 7,700 square miles of private land and 6,400 square miles of public, uh, summing to around 14,000 uh, square miles in total, which constitutes roughly 14% of the Oregon um, state total land area. So next, um, shown here are the elk density distributions on public and private land. The public land kernel density clusters are shown in purple and private clusters are shown in green. Uh, what immediately stood out to me was that the public land cluster um, stays pretty centralized near the western side of Matilla um, National Forest near the BLM land area in the Primeville district. However, um, despite the cluster itself not moving much, the density does seem to decrease uh, as you move throughout uh, the year. 
For private lands, however, the cluster densities are not quite as high, um, but they do remain pretty moderate in size. Uh, and there do seem to be consistently increased numbers of, of these clusters throughout the Blue Mountain region um, than those on public land. So this seems to indicate that elk are more densely distributed and likely spending more time uh, throughout the year on these public lands or private lands. So um, up next, uh, I wanted to discuss the um, proportion of total elk individuals on public and private lands each month uh, throughout the years 20 and 2021. 2020 and 2021. Uh, so as you can see, over 90% of total elk individuals were found to be on private land for uh, five months uh, per year, uh, with an overall average of 88.3%. Uh, the less elk individuals are found to be on public land throughout the same time frame, with an average of around 73%. So up next is a graph showing, again, the proportion of total elk individuals recorded on public and private land. Uh, with blue lines showing uh, public land between years and orange shades showing uh, private. I wanted to highlight this data to show that there is some consistency in trends between years uh, and land types. Uh, once again, uh, the data from these years indicates that private land has an increased number of elk individuals. Um, I'm hoping to do some more in-depth analysis um, on this area and assess uh, how focusing on particular wilderness wilderness areas and national forests might impact these trends. So uh, these graphs show the proportion of elk on uh, private and public land by month. However, uh, this time with some individual day assessments. Uh, basically, they show the GPS locations broken out daily, sorted into various daylight categories. Uh, crepuscular for individuals located on these lands between 4.30 a.m. and 8.30 a.m and between 4.30 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. And then daylight between 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. And nighttime between 8.30 p.m. and 4.30 a.m. Uh, I was interested in seeing when the elk were using uh, the land throughout the day in hopes of noting any particular trends or greater insights than just looking at a blanket number of individuals per month. So as you can see, private lands uh, have a much higher proportion of elk visited locations than public lands. Uh, it also appears that the general shape or trend uh, of the private land is much more um, stable or level, uh, while the general trend for the public land is a lot more erratic. And as you can see, the trend lines uh, within each graph stay fairly uh, uniform, which indicates that these elk are utilizing um, crepuscular using these lands uh, during crepuscular day and night hours um, relatively uniformly. So um, another item that we were interested in assessing is the start, how the various, how did the start of various hunting seasons um, influences the distribution of elk on public and private lands. So I wanted to give you all a quick preliminary assessment of that. Um, I've indicated on in red on the maps where the start of these hunting seasons are. Um, basically starting at the end of August and ending around October 31st. Um, so this is a close-up of that previous graph um, shown within the red bars. Um, the one on the left is private and the one on the right is public. And um, I've included a month-long buffer before and after the hunting season, just so you can see um, what the trends are like before the hunting season actually starts. So as you can see, the linear trend line shows that the proportion of elk GPS location um, on private land tends to increase as hunting season progresses, while on public land, the proportion tends to decrease, um, which is actually kind of what we expected to see. And it would make sense um, for elk to relocate from uh, public areas where hunting is allowed during these times into more private areas where it's not. Uh, though further analysis is required to assess uh, the validity of this claim, which we are hoping to do some more of over the coming weeks. So our initial project challenges that we faced were defining the project scope and identifying and prioritizing our deliverables. We were able to narrow down the deliverables to a manageable list and are on track to accomplish nearly all of them. Uh, during our project, we ran into some bumps in the road, identifying appropriate analysis methods, for example, deciding to manually select migration dates versus using the density-based clustering tool, as Sam mentioned, and uh, challenges building, building and running models as well as uh, some double counting issues in the data caused by irregular caller signaling intervals. And finally, we foresee some challenges with packaging up the final models and geodatabase for handoff to our project sponsor. However, we have a little bit more time to flush this out before the project comes to an end. 
Our next steps in the coming weeks are to finalize the home range migration and distribution summaries, maps, and graphs. We're working on a script to remove existing collaring duplicates caused by irregular collar signaling intervals and finalize assessments and temporal tracking of individuals in wildlife areas, complete analysis of elk in response to human disturbance and package of our models in geodatabase for handoff to our project sponsor. We'd like to take the time to thank our instructors from the University of Washington GIS certificate program, as well as our project sponsors, Melody Henderson and Steve Cherry from ODFW. We are grateful to be working on such an interesting project and look forward to wrapping up the next step shortly. So thank you all for listening to our project and now we have time for questions. Perfect timing, 15 minutes exactly. <laughs> we planned right. for that. <laughs> Three minutes for questions. Do the judges have any questions? I have a couple, maybe, if uh, nobody else. I asked questions last time, so I want to be fair. But um, I think it's pretty interesting to have all of this sort of big data. So how were you able to get some of this information from fish and wildlife? And did they have to do any like pre-processing for you or kind of how did that come to you? Yeah, um, so we received from ODFW a geodatabase containing just our elk positions. Um, so it, you know, was, was a fairly big file containing over 300,000 data points. Um, they also sent us a spreadsheet in Excel of um, the individual ID numbers associated with that table, um, deployment dates, and then uh, mortality dates uh, for any elk that they had uh, noted as deceased during the study time. From that, uh, we derived um, any subsequent data that we needed or found all of the uh, land use data through other sources. And there were that many collared individuals, but how many are in the herd total? Or is that, do they do all of them as a subsample? Uh, yeah, there are approximately 4,000 elk in the study area with 144 collared individuals. Do you happen to know the sampling interview or interval for those collars? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the collars pinged at 13 hour intervals, um, which allowed them to take roughly uh, by deal points, but because of the extra hour, we were, weren't just sampling the same times throughout the entire two year study period, giving us a better um, view into the daily patterns of the animals. Were you using mostly desktop software or were you switching in between ArcGIS Online and utilizing all of Esri Suite? Yeah, pretty much exclusively uh, Arc Pro, um, but we are interested in potentially uh, using some ArcGIS Online um, to create various web, map, web maps to illustrate this data so it's a little more interactive. Great. It seems like it'd be a good project for a story map if you guys have used that format before. Yeah, definitely. That's kind of one of the options we're toying with. Yeah. I have a question. You had mentioned duplicates and the need to use Python to in the future to to take care of those duplicates. What I didn't quite understand what's causing the duplicates in the data. Yeah, um, I can answer that question. So um, something that we kind of discovered as we were analyzing this data was um, that the vast majority of callers would ping at 13 hour intervals, but um, there were a fairly significant uh, portion of callers. I haven't determined exactly um, what this proportion is yet, but it's pretty low, I think less than 10%, um, actually would ping at five hour increments, um, which um, when I was doing some of the land classification studies, um, it was causing uh, some, uh, particularly when I was looking at the um, crepuscular versus daylight and um, nighttime classifications, um, I was finding that there were um, a couple duplicates of these individuals. So I, um, these individuals with the collars that uh, ping every five hours. So um, the Python script I'm writing is, um, 
hopefully going to be able to remove those individuals um, to er eradicate any <laughs> form of this um, unforeseen duplication. Great, thank you. That's our three minutes for questions. Thank you so much to Samuel and Eliza and Molly. And judges, I will give you two minutes to fill out your scorecards. And Annika, you will be up next. So feel free to start sharing your screen and we'll get moving to the third one after two minutes. All right, thank you judges. Up next, we will have Annika Johnson from the University of Washington Tacoma. And Annika will be showcasing her project on developing a nesting habitat suitability index for Washington and Oregon sandhill cranes. So when you're ready, uh, go ahead, uh, Annika. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, so my project was on developing nesting habitat uh, suitability index for Washington and Oregon cranes. And I'm an undergraduate student at University of Washington majoring in environmental science with a focus on conservation, biology, and ecology. And this project was completed from a GIS certificate, which I finished up in March. Why is this changing slides? There we are. So a little bit of background about sandhill cranes. Uh, they are one of only two crane species native to North America and the population across the continent is made up of multiple regional and migratory populations with, which has six total subspecies. So the cranes that currently nest in Washington and Oregon are part of the central flyway population, which is unique in the fact that it has uh, three of these subspecies as opposed to one, which is what most of the migratory populations are made up of. So the central flyway population has greater sandhill cranes, the GC tabata, GC rowani, and GC canadensis species. And this population, uh, as far as we know, um, all the three subspecies have roughly the same ecology, although it has been noted that GC, uh, GC rowani typically is a little bit more partial to coastal regions for nesting and foraging uh, activities. And like a lot of migratory bird species, they are really dependent on wetland wet prairies and upland for nesting and foraging, which makes them really susceptible to um, population issues due to development. So the range in population for sandhill cranes in the last 200 years has declined significantly, mostly due to wetland development, like I mentioned, but also due to alterations in water regime as we pull more water for uh, cities and urban areas and also um, for agriculture and the changes in agricultural practices, particularly on the east side of the Cascade Mountains has impacted the cranes as well, since they typically use 
um, agricultural fields when they are not in use for um, foraging and stopover during their migration routes. So there isn't a lot of great population estimates for the cranes, but there uh, is records of historically them nesting in both Washington and Oregon and being present in the lowland Puget Sound area where they were nesting, um, particularly in um, the prairies uh, oak habitat, as well as in the coastal areas and west of the Cascade Mountains, which there are not currently any known large nesting sites in the western half of Washington, but they are still present nesting in the western half of Oregon. So the focus area for my project uh, was the Washington and Oregon state borders. Uh, and I chose this because since it, they are a migratory species that covers a really large range, California to Oregon to Washington, and then up into British Columbia and Southern Canada, it's really hard to look at just one state or one area without considering how the population that exists in Oregon uh, is affecting those that are living in Washington. And also the cranes are not currently federally listed as an endangered species. They were in 1960, uh, 19, 66, but they were delisted in 1973 when the eastern populations were kind of considered to have been recovered. But they are listed as endangered species in Washington and in Oregon in three of the ecoregions they are listed as species of concern. So since they are listed for two of these states, I figured this was a really kind of needed um, activity to consider potential areas where nesting uh, protection could be increased. So what analysis has already been done? Uh, there has been a USGS gap analysis project, uh, project habitat distribution map created um, in 2001. And this was based on the known ranges of the species and known habitat conditions. But even though at this time there was known populations in Washington and Oregon, the map really only was able to determine that they were existing in Oregon, even though there's uh, there was nesting sites in Yakima County and in the Southern Cascades of Washington. And uh, as an endangered species in Washington, there is a species recovery plan where uh, habitat suitability was identified, but it was only identified in three counties. And like I said, there has been known uh, nesting sites in more than three counties at this point. So it was a little bit odd to me that there was uh, only three counties identified as like critical habitat areas. So my goals of the project were to, to determine suitability um, of land for nesting, identify if existing and past nesting sets are continuing to be suitable or if they've changed due to development, and then to see if these areas that I have uh, identified align with reported eWord sightings. So the data that I pulled from were all primarily uh, national data sets. So I used the uh, US Fish and Wildlife uh, National Wetland Inventory to determine wetland type, as well as water stability regime throughout the growing season. Um, to determine surrounding foraging area, I primarily used the USGS National um, 2011 GAP slash Land Fire Terrestrial Ecosystem Database, uh, which was then updated with the land cover from 2018 LCD, uh, as well as roads from the, obtained from DNR and Oregon Department of Transportation, uh, and elevation through USGS, uh, DEM layers, and then the EVER data from 2021 for the full year. So the, method, the methods for my project primarily were based off of HSIs done for Florida Santa Hill cranes by Buck, and then a Northern Ohio HSI and carrying capacity model that was developed for greater Santa Hill cranes. But I had to sort of alter the way that they did things because obviously Ohio and Florida are not considering elevation significantly in their model, but for Washington and Oregon, there's a large mountain chain and you need to consider elevation. So I restricted the model to below um, 1,500 meters based on the literature. And like I mentioned before, the four suitability variables that I considered were wetland type, foraging area, roads, and then water stability. So for wetland type, this was initially reclassified on a zero to two scale with two being the most suitable, one being semi-suitable and zero being not suitable. Uh, and this was primarily based on water depth and the sort of bottom of the wetland area versus so if it was an unconsolidated bottom, a rocky bottom, sandy bottom, muddy, or some kind of vegetation. 
foraging area was determined from the gap ecosystems, like I mentioned, and reclassified based on the macro group uh, level of ecosystems. So this allowed me to, based on the literature, determine uh, which were most suitable for the cranes, uh, primarily based on vegetation that is used in nesting. And I used circular, circular focal statistics uh, at 400 meters to determine cells in the raster that had the most amounts of suitable uh, foraging area around that unique cell. So if a cell had more suitable land around it, then it would gain a higher score than something that only had maybe one suitable cell around it and the rest were considered developable plants. Roads, I used 200 and 400 meters concentric buffers to determine areas that were too close to roads where it would cause crane disturbance and then they would um, abandon their nests. And then water stability was determined off of the US Fish and Wildlife wetland database and uh, classified based on how stable the conditions are throughout the growing season because having water stability throughout the season protects the cranes from predators and it also provides a constant food source throughout the um, nesting season for colts that are unable to fly. And then all of these values were uh, converted to rasters and reclassified on a zero to two scale. And I used the following HSI uh, formula to find a uh, greater values. And these were all converted to a 30 meter raster. So these are the results of my habitat suitability index, which is a little bit difficult to view on this large of a scale, but it's interesting to see the areas that have the largest uh, areas of wetlands that are suitable for crane nesting. We see them prim primarily on the east side of Washington and then primarily in Southern Oregon. So the results found that there was generally more nesting habitat of a large size and a high suitability score in Oregon than there was in Washington, which makes sense due to the large urban corridor, as well as the mountainous regions. So for Oregon, there was an average HSI score of 2.65, with standard deviation of 0.87, and Washington, it was 2.024. So two of the regions that I wanted to highlight here are areas that have historic known nesting, uh, so the upper area is Camas Prairie, and so this was a very uh, prominent nesting location for birds initially before there was extensive development in the southern area. On the bottom here is Mount Hare National Wildlife Refuge, which has continued to be a nesting, a primary nesting location for cranes. Um, and so the fact that it has selected both of these kind of uh, shows that they are continued, can continue to support cranes and could have increased preservation to maybe support more nesting pairs to establish there. And we also see a large wetland complex highlighted outside of Cheney. And so this is an interesting thing to look at because a lot of the other areas that are highlighted with high suitability scores were large wetland, uh, larger wetlands surrounding lakes or pond uh, compounds. But this has lots of smaller areas due to riparian areas. Um, and then also in Southern Oregon, a lot of different uh, larger wetlands surrounding uh, the Klamath area. And I wanted to do a little bit of eBird validation, which if anyone's not familiar with eBird, it is a community sourced um, bird reporting um, app. So you can go in and submit your sightings of birds. So I used the sightings that were reported from January to December 2021 to validate the sites that I had uh, that were over an HSI of three. And so I excluded sites that were only flyovers because there's a lot of reported sightings for flyovers which aren't very relevant to land use by cranes. So those were excluded. And then any land that was identified with an HSI of greater than three was compared to the eBER sightings. So any sightings within 0 0.5 miles. So 77.9% uh, of sites in Washington were within 0 0.5 miles of a reported sighting, and in Oregon, 81.7% of sites were within 0 0.5 miles of the reported sighting. Thank you. Is there any questions I can answer? Thank you, Annika. We will give you three minutes for questions. Um, I actually have a question I want to start out with. Uh, uh -huh. 
So you mentioned you're working with data provided by national agencies and then two state agencies. And did this cause any problems, maybe them having different data formats or, or fields or attributes? Like, did you have to kind of massage data so that it could work well together? Um, primarily, I used uh, national data sets for the ones that went into the suitability uh, index because I wanted to remain that consistency between them. That was like the primary goal of my project was to use those national data sets. Uh, the state level data I used was just roads. So those were a little bit easier to combine because the grading system on roads is kind of consistent or pretty similar between states. Gotcha. That was easy for me to account for those differences. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, I think this is pretty interesting. Again, it's kind of sort of about the data sharing or what are some of the next steps that you anticipate? Um, if I were to continue to work on this project, one of the main things I would want to kind of continue working on before there was more data sharing would definitely be to include, um, I consider all the roads that I considered in my project evenly. Um, but I did not consider, consider smaller roads like agricultural access roads or forest service roads and things like that. So I'd want to include those because those are still impacting cranes, particularly in the east side where there's a lot of agricultural areas or where there's national wildlife refuges that are open for multi-use. So I would want to kind of update that to consider the more fine-grained roads that are there. And as far as next approach, I probably would want to start working on an online portal to access this information because right now I just have kind of hard copy maps of things. Thank you. Great job, Annika. This is Stella. And I have a question about the roads data set did you take into account road type? And if not, was there just uh, uh, with the buffer, did you take into account, no, did you take into account road type? I did not. That was, I guess, what I was getting at. What I would like to improve in the future yeah. was include the road types. So like highways obviously have a more significant buffer. Um, they were all pretty standard, but the areas where there was really large highways, um, generally had more buffers around them because it was a large highway. Obviously, there's more roads around it. So it kind of self corrects but that's definitely a feature I'd like to work on in the future. How did you um, get into this topic? Where, are, are, do you have familiarity with uh, habitat or bird species or something like that? Or how did, how did you end up picking this project? Um, I actually don't have any prior experience working on like conservation, like bird conservation projects, but I just personally really enjoy going bird watching and stuff in my personal time. So I wanted to kind of take a look at what factors kind of were important for determining, you know, protected bird areas. Makes it way easier to work on a project when you're interested in the subject, doesn't it? It does, especially yeah. if it involves doing a lot of reading on it. It <laughs> helps to like what you're doing. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the use of the E, the crowdsource data. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'd love to work with that a little bit more. It was definitely very interesting. All right, that's our three minutes. Thanks so much, Annika and judges. Thank you so much. We will give the judges another two minutes. And our last presenter should be getting ready and can take over the screen. That would be Chi Run and Zhang Yang.
All right, we are ready for our final presentation. Uh, today we are going to end with Qi uh, Run Zhao and Zhang Yang Wang. And you'll have to tell me if I got that right. I took three years of Mandarin in college and I hope it came to good use. But uh, they are going to be presenting, or they are from the University of Washington, and they're presenting on their projects uh, entitled or titled Analysis and Prospect of Public Transportation in Seattle Area for Living Convenience. So with that, uh, we're going to start your time and hand it over to you. So first of all, I um, have to pronounce very correctly. So um, we are a group of self-motivated students interested in transportation and urban planning. So um, the rapid development of the transit system plays a huge role in improving public transportation and facilitating residents living convenience due to the relatively long construction period and high cost of transit hub projects it is necessary to evaluate and predict the design phase in order to be able to meet the requirements of the long-term planning okay um i'm Zheng yang uh the main data type we used in this project and uh, our, our P, uh, pure high data, which is point of interest. And uh, the uh, geometric elements such as stations, road networks, uh, regional boundaries, et cetera. So we obtained basic geographic and ge uh, ge geometric data through uh, Seattle GIS data portal. And uh, we obtained the uh, roads and station informations uh, of Link uh, and King County Metro through the GIS data sets provided on the uh, official website. Um, we collected POI data from a website called sleepo.eu, which provides updated POI data sets uh, in various for formats for uh, easier uh, data manipulation and uh, um, to fully uh, represent the categories of POI data in the Seattle area, we roughly classified uh, classified them according to uh, their category fields. And based on subcategory, uh, we merged some POIs that could belong to the same category. Uh, we combined automotive, business, and uh, accommodation to be business services, and combined land use and public service to be uh, public facilities, combined sport and tourism tourism to be sports and entertainment. Uh, we collect uh, totally 16,029 uh, data. POI data points and uh, uh, for different categories, they have different counts. Uh, we have transportation, POIs in most and uh, religious sites, sites uh, list. So in order to an uh, analyze uh, living convenience, we first start by analyzing those POI data and perform a kernel density analysis for each category. Um, kernel density here calculates the density of each category uh, features uh, in the neighborhood around them. So for business services, we can see uh, an absolute high uh, kernel density at the downtown area. Uh, also areas at UW area and uh, Westwood land, uh, they all show higher current density level. So for uh, cartering services, house uh, services, shopping services, and sport and entertainment, they all show the similar pattern um, with like three polar. Um, so there are two uh, categories that don't quite 
align with these patterns. So one is education, uh, which has POIs with extremely high uh, kernel density at UDAF and uh, religious sites. Um, it has high kernel density centers in Northern, Central and Southern area. Also for uh, public facilities and transportation facilities, uh, they are relatively more evenly distributed throughout the Seattle area, but we can still see a pattern of high current density at uh, UW and uh, downtown area. So uh, to, to summarize current density analysis, we did one more over the entire uh, POI data set. Uh, the pattern will show in you know, a more apparent, um, a more apparent way. We see downtown area has riches, social and uh, uh, commercial resources and uh, facility services, followed by the University of Washington Seattle campus and the North Shore of Salmon Bay with high density convenient facilities. So we, uh, we also do uh, accessibility analysis based on the uh, light uh, link, a uh, link light rail transportation. So uh, uh, can children keep going? Yeah, sure. Um, so we conduct a, an accessibility analysis on the link stations to show the passenger flow attraction area and service area of the link station using transportation accessibility indicators. So um, the accessibility is the primary factor in evaluating the convenience of the living area, which refers to the ease of access to facilities from the point of residence. Um, we first obtained the road network data from the Seattle Geodata portal and pre-process it by creating a network data set, calculating the access time and other specifications. We then filter data that has a crossing time less than one second. Um, then we perform the network analysis to obtain the 100 meter, 300 meter and 500 meter accessibility ranges around the link station, which is shown in map. So depending on the road um, network, the area around each station varies. Um, so we also did a evaluation of the spatial correlation on the point of interest data. So the spatial correlation analysis is a statistical test that can be used to analyze the spatial clustering characteristics of evaluation indicators at a given level of, level of significance. So we first conducted the global autocorrelation analysis, the global MERS I, which is about 0 0.39 and the p-value less than 0 0.05. So we can um, reject the null and say that there is a significant clustering of public services facilities in Seattle. Then we did a um, high-low clustering analysis and the statistics show that the, um, um, there is a cluster of high values actually. We then take one step forward and did a cluster and outlier analysis and calculate the local Marin's I indicator. And we got three spatial correlation patterns, high, high cluster, low, low cluster, and low high cluster outliers. So um, for the high, high cluster, which indicates that both the living circle and adjacent living circle meet the standards well and are highlands of public service facil facilities. Um, it is mainly located in downtown area and U district. Um, this kind of area has well-constructed infrastructure and supporting facilities. It can be combined with the actual needs of residents and conditioning on the surplus of resources at more facilities in a more kind of um, focused manner. And for the low, low cluster, which indicates that both this living circle and the adjacent living circle are poor in meeting the standards and belong to facilities depressions. 
It is mainly located at the edge of the urban area in the southern part of Seattle. Such areas are extremely lacking in supporting facilities, and there are no complementary and mutual use facilities in the surrounding area. So priority should be given to these areas in the near future. For the low high outliers, which means that the standard of this living circle is poor, but the standard of the neighboring living circle is good. It is mainly located around the high high cluster areas like in the eastern and western part of Seattle. For such areas, they can be guided to share the neighboring facilities in the short term and in the long term, adding facilities um, that is based on actual demands of residents. Okay, uh, after we consider both POI curiosity and accessibility uh, based, on, based on the uh, link light rail stations, we got uh, several observations and interpretations. So the first one is uh, the good accessibility area starting from uh, link stations overlaps with high density POI clusters such as the downtown area and areas around UW campus. And the second is the, the abundance and density of POI is highly related to uh, light rail stations. And we can see some um, small, but with relatively high intense uh, uh, kernel density POI areas in the south of uh, Seattle, uh, all of which are consistent with the location of the light rail stations. Uh, this shows the uh, con convenience level and accessibility may have uh, mutually reinforced effects. And the third is um, there is a high kernel density region near uh, Ballard and uh, Fremont. Uh, this pattern is seen across many categories in uh, kernel density, but by comparison with light rail station accessibility and lights uh, and uh, city bus lines, we see uh, low mass transit in this area's accessibility. So residents um, living here or from other place, places who do not own a car uh, might need to suffer high expense uh, from public transportation. And uh, uh, actually, Seattle has planned an extension of uh, light rail uh, program in 2032 to 2037, connecting uh, Southwest uh, Seattle to, to, to Ballard, Fremont area. Uh, this plan somehow matches out uh, our outlooks we think our analysis of uh, POI data and tra transit accessibility can be explained to uh, some extent the reason for this planned route. Um, so we do realize that there are some kind of limitation within our data. Um, so the point of interest data is expressed in the form of points. So it has to be aggregated to a certain level before any more um, in-depth analysis. However, the method we use in the study can actually be applied to many other fields such as shared bicycles or even public restrooms. And we could also join um, the demographic data or into our shape files and maybe adding more um, um, road networks such as bicycle networks, um, streetcar networks, and more into our study. So, um, there's actually a lot to think about um, in terms of um, the transit um, planning, uh, especially for the Department of Transportation in Seattle um, area. And I think that's it for our presentation. And we are welcome for any questions. Awesome, thank you. I will start the timer for three minutes of questioning. I have a question. First of all, I have to say that I, I really enjoyed your talk. I grew up in Seattle and uh, 
lived in the North End and went to school in the South End. And I was thinking as you were giving your talk, how interest, it would be really interesting to look at your study in relation to history in Seattle as well. And my, my question for you is, are you thinking about going into urban planning? Um, actually, yes, we are especially just um, interested in um, urban planning, especially in transportation and affordable housing. So, um, yeah, we are really, really just hoping, looking forward to joining this um, field or maybe a career in urban planning. I'm going to come off mute. This is Dan. Um, transportation and commuting, kind of one of my pet peeves. Um, I used to carpool with a guy for 13 years, but he retired. So now I'm stuck driving by myself, which I hate. Um, did you, you know, kind of uh, like what Annika said about doing some background uh, investigation on the different agencies that are dealing with Seattle, because we have people coming in from Snohomish County and mass transit, people coming from uh, Pierce County, and how much coordination or lack thereof is going on between planning to move people from one place to another. It, it seems like Seattle is like 35 years behind the times in putting in light rail, especially when we had the, uh, the, the uh, monorail that was in the 1962 World's Fair as the, you know, transportation of the future, but here we are. <laughs> Yeah, actually, um, actually, we, um, I think we are new to Seattle, so we don't uh, have too much knowledge about the, the background or history, but we are interested uh, in that. Um, yeah, uh, we think the uh, public transportation Mm. It's more like a, an equity to different group of people. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just just I, curious about any background. If you've done any, you know, did any research in doing what you're doing, but uh, it is it is a long history because mm -hmm. it's behind the times we voted against, or I say Seattle voted against it a long time, and now they're suffering. Uh, with, you know, commuting, some of the, the worst commuting in the entire country. All right, that is our three minutes. Thank you, Chi Run and Zhang Yang. Um, we're going to give our judges two minutes to finish their scoring, and then please stick around. We just have a couple of things to mention. Uh, some closing comments for the students and judges. And so let's give the judges two minutes for right now.
All right, so that's gonna wrap up our 2022 Dick Thomas Award and competition. And we just want to thank everyone again who participated, all of the students, the judges, the volunteers, the coordinators. Um, we're really grateful for you to offer our, your Friday morning. It's not always easy to, to uh, balance work and school and everything with the competition, but we appreciate it so much. And I think I speak for all judges and volunteers and audience members, everyone that was here today that all of the presentations were thoroughly impressive. And um, to kind of delve into the prizes, um, we just want to reiterate that it's it was a great opportunity for you to present your work here. And, and just presenting will in front of other GIS professionals is going to be invaluable to you. But you're also going to create an association or a relationship with everyone who got to see your work today. Um, and we'll remind you that there are cash prizes for our top three project presenters um, and that the top presenter will also get free admission to next year's 2023 conference, which is um, a great value. Um, all four groups are going to be granted a one year free membership to the Washington GIS Association. And just a reminder, Wajissa is a fantastic community that fosters a lot of relationships and collaborations and opportunities for GIS professionals and students alike. So take advantage of that free membership. And uh, I think a lot of good will come from it. I also wanna uh, take a second to do a special thanks to all the advisors of the students. We do have Gregory Lund here from UW Tacoma, uh, Matthew Kelly from UW Tacoma, Harvey Arnone from the University of Washington and Jamie Crawford from the University of Washington. And then last, we also want to thank uh, Heather Glock, who is not here today, but um, in addition to being an Esri employee in the state of Washington and a board, uh, with just a board member, she's also the editor of our summit newsletter. And this is a newsletter that goes out to hundreds of GIS professionals in the state and in the area. Um, and she has offered, like she does every year, to um, place all four of your guys' projects to be featured in the Summit newsletter. So your work uh, will not only go up on YouTube today, but it will additionally be available to Washington GIS professionals all over the place. So uh, that's a great opportunity to showcase your work and get your names out there so people can see what you're up to. Um, just a reminder, the students, our conference is happening next week, Tuesday through Thursday, and you guys in, in uh, earning the opportunity to present here, you are granted free admission to the conference. And so um, be sure to check in that email thread that we've been have, have going on for the last couple months and use the code that I provided to sign up for a free admission to the conference. And lastly, the results are gonna be announced during the Thursday session of the conference next week. But we also will email out the results shortly after that. So it'd be great if you could be there, especially if you win, we will give you a little bit of stage time to you know, uh, acknowledge the results. So um, one more reminder, judges, please remember to fill out your scores by the end of the day today, if possible, so that they're fresh in your mind. And, uh, the last thing we just want to say that we're really pleased with the future GIS professionals that are coming out of Washington, our, our state GIS programs. And thank you everyone who put in the work and the effort today. And we hope you got out of it as much as we did as well. So thanks everyone. <laughs> the silent claps. <laughs> Here.